These are the stories making the headlines at this hour. South Korea posted another current account surplus in November as the recovery continues in exports driven by the auto and chip industries. This has offset the widening deficit in services resulting from increased outbound travel. Now there's one day to go until CES 2024 kicks up in Las Vegas. Artificial intelligence will take center stage with South Korea's Samsung and LG to showcase next-generation TVs that use AI and transparent screens. A suspected Israeli strike kills a Hezbollah commander in Lebanon. Concerns rise over broader regional conflict while the Israel-Hamas war continues. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the war won't end anytime soon. Good afternoon. South Korea posted another current account surplus in November as the recovery continues in exports driven by the auto and chip industries. This has offset the widening deficit in services resulting from increased outbound travel. Our An Song Jin starts us off. South Korea's current account balance for November last year saw surplus yet again on the back of improving exports. According to preliminary data released by the Bank of Korea on Tuesday, the current account balance saw monthly surplus for the seventh consecutive month, with the surplus for November standing at 4.06 billion U.S. dollars. The goods account saw a surplus of $7 billion in November, nearly $2 billion higher than the month before as exports saw strong performance and imports fell. Exports saw an on-year increase of 7 percent on the back of an improvement in the semiconductor industry and a recovery in trade with China. In terms of items, exports of automobiles, semiconductors and chemical products increased, while exports of petroleum and coal products dropped. In terms of region, exports to the U.S. rose by 24.7 percent compared to the year before, while exports to both Japan and Southeast Asia increased by 11 percent. Imports fell by 8 percent compared to the previous year on a drop in fossil fuel prices. Meanwhile, a services account which tracks the inflow and outflow of business services, tourism and transportation recorded a $2.13 billion deficit. The widening deficit compared to October is largely attributed to fewer tourists from Southeast Asia and China, combined with more Koreans traveling and spending money abroad. The accumulated current account balance surplus from January to November last year is $27.4 billion, which is $300 million more than for the same period in 2022. An Song-jin, Arirang News. The prices of entertainment and cultural activities last year saw the largest jump in 27 years. According to Statistics Korea, the related price index increased 3.7 percent on year. Sports events, overseas group travel, photography services and singing rooms also large price increases. Fees for amusement facilities, performing arts events and cultural lessons also rose by over 5 percent. Meanwhile, portable multimedia devices such as tablet PCs saw an increase of 17.9 percent, largely due to higher launch prices for new products. Samsung Electronics' operating profit for last year is estimated to be 85 percent down on weak semiconductor businesses. But there were some signs of improvement detected in the fourth quarter, raising the possibility of a better performance this year. Park Konu reports. South Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics saw its lowest annual operating profits in 15 years in 2023. According to preliminary data revealed by the company on Tuesday, operating profits came to 6.54 trillion won, or around 5 billion U.S. dollars, a drop of 84.92 percent from the year before. It's the lowest that yearly operating profits have fallen since 2008, which was attributed to sluggish semiconductor performance as memory chip prices plunged during the year. Samsung's device solutions division that manages its chip business saw a cumulative deficit of approximately $9.1 billion from the first to third quarter last year. Operating profits started to improve in quarter four due to a reduction in production and chip inventories. Meanwhile, despite on-quarter operating profits for quarters one to three last year, quarter four saw a drop on-year. In the fourth quarter alone, 
operating profits fell around 35 percent compared to the year before to around $2.1 billion, falling short of the London Stock Exchange Group's smart estimate of around $2.8 billion. But according to an analyst at Japanese financial services firm Daiwa Capital Markets, a surge in chip prices seen since quarter four last year is expected to continue into 2024, meaning an earnings rebound for chip makers in the near future. Park Onu, Arirang News. Now there's one day to go until CES 2024 kicks off in Las Vegas. Artificial intelligence will take center stage with South Korea's Samsung and LG to showcase next generation TVs that use AI and transparent screens. Our Shin Young tells us what to expect. The world's largest tech show, the Consumer Electronics Show, where visitors can be among the first to experience global tech trends, is about to kick off in Las Vegas on Tuesday local time. Under the theme of All Together, All On, this year's trade show focuses on using innovative technology to tackle global issues. The combined exhibition area covers a vast space of over 240,000 square meters, a 30 percent increase from last year. Some 3,500 companies from 150 countries are taking part. From South Korea, around 760 companies, including startups and major players like LG Electronics, Samsung Electronics, Hyundai Motor Group and SK will showcase their latest cutting-edge technologies. This makes Korea the third largest country in terms of participation after the U.S. and China. At CES 2024, AI developments in a variety of fields, including home appliances, healthcare, and automotive, are expected to take center stage. Ahead of the opening, South Korea's tech giants unveiled a range of next generation TVs. LG Electronics presented the world's first wireless transparent OLED TV, the LG Signature OLED T. When turned off, it's practically invisible, blending into the surroundings and making the space feel bigger. And you can see beyond the screen and move it freely thanks to its transparent screen and wireless technology. It is complemented by top-notch picture quality and LG OLED powered by the new Alpha 11 AI processor. Samsung Electronics revealed its latest QLED and micro LED TVs. The announcement also conveyed plans to open what the firm calls the era of AI screen with the introduction of a next-generation AI processor set to redefine the perception of smart display capabilities. Samsung's AI screen is powered by on-device AI technology. We, we will be the centerpiece of your AI home, connecting all your devices to offer more flexible and diverse lifestyle with no boundaries on or off screen. With curiosity about how AI will break down barriers in various industries, the four-day event is expected to attract over 130,000 people from around the world. Shin Ayong, Arirang News. Saudi Arabia's decision to cut crude oil prices for all regions for February has led to a plunge in oil prices on Monday. Prices of West Texas Intermediate dropped over 4 percent, while Brent crude oil, the international benchmark, slid 3.4 percent. This decline in WTI prices is the biggest drop seen since November last year. According to a Reuters report, this is a sign that lower demand is offsetting rising geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, which contributed to a 2 percent climb in prices last week. President Yoon Suk-yeol says 2024 must become a year of recovery for Korean livelihoods, with his push to remove barriers between government and society. Presiding over his first cabinet meeting of the year, Yoon on Tuesday once again called for efforts to break down walls between ministries and between the government and the people. According to the new style of policy briefings given to the president, which began with discussions with citizens last week, Yoon said his administration should listen and take action to turn issues raised by citizens into effective change felt in everyday lives. 
He also voiced his support for the 2024 Winter Youth Olympics, which will begin on the 19th in Kangwondo Province, emphasizing safety precautions and pan-government efforts to hold an enjoyable sporting event for some 1,900 participants arriving from 18 countries. Now turning over to escalating tensions on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's military said there will no longer be a buffer zone to prevent accidental clashes between South and North Korea. The move essentially terminates the inter-Korean military agreement in response to Pyongyang's recent artillery shelling near the maritime border. Our Peunji has more. On September 19, 2018, the two Korea signed an inter-Korea military agreement that set up buffer zones for land, air and sea to reduce tensions and prevent accidental clashes. But following the North's recent provocations, the South Korean military officially declared on Monday that these zones outlined in the agreement are no longer effective. North Korea has breached the September 19 military agreement more than 3,000 times, and over the last three days, it has fired artillery shells in the West Sea. As a result, the zone where all hostile activities are banned no longer exists. The Joint Chiefs of Staff also said the military will not respond to every provocation initiated by North Korea, and instead conduct firing exercises according to its own schedule. The maritime buffer zone in the West Sea extends 135 kilometers. That's 85 kilometers south of the NLL, or the northern Limen line that separates the two Koreas, and 50 kilometers north of the line. There is also a separate buffer zone in the East Sea that spans 80 kilometers. Provocative actions are prohibited in these zones, including firing artillery shells and coastal guns. The North had already said last November that it's withdrawing from the pact, and it has rebuilt guard posts inside the DMZ. With South Korea's announcement on Monday, the agreement is now practically scrapped. This comes after the South Korean military detected around 90 artillery shots by the North on Sunday afternoon. North Korea also fired over 200 shells on Friday and 60 on Saturday. However, in an attempt to shame the South Korean military's detection capabilities, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong, claimed the North had not fired a single shell on Saturday but instead detonated explosives simulating the sound of artillery fire. The South Korean military immediately dismissed the statement, calling it a, quote, comedy-like propaganda. In fact, according to military sources, the South Korean military detected the North blowing up explosives only 10 times before and after Saturday's shelling, which shows the North's claims are not true. An expert says the intention behind North Korea's latest provocation is to grab local and international headlines in a world distracted by Gaza and Ukraine uh, that North Korea is saying we're still here and we're starting the year uh, uh, with these types of artillery rounds uh, that garners a lot of international attention. It... Pounds, Arirang News. A suspected Israeli strike has killed Hezbollah commander in Lebanon. Concerns rise over a broader regional conflict while the Israel-Hamas war continues. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the war won't end anytime soon. Yi sing has more. Hezbollah says one of its top-ranking commanders has been killed in an Israeli attack in southern Lebanon. Lebanon state media said Wissam Tawil, who is considered one of the most prominent figures in the Lebanese militant group, was killed in an Israeli airstrike that targeted a car that the commander was in. According to AFP, Tawil had a leading role in managing Hezbollah's operations in the south of Lebanon. However, Israel did not comment on the attack, but it did say it had hit Hezbollah targets in response to cross-border attacks. Regarding the war in Gaza Strip, the office of the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu released a joint statement from both the Prime Minister and Defense Chief Yoav Gallant, where the two stressed that the war there would not end anytime soon and that it would continue for many months. They also called for international support in order for them to continue the fighting in Gaza. Speaking to the New York Times, Israel Defense Forces spokesperson Daniel Hagari said its military has begun a new, less intensive phase in its war against Hamas in Gaza. He added that the new phase means fewer ground troops and airstrikes. The comments came hours before U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken arrived in Israel. 
to discuss the transition to the next phase in fighting and preventing the conflict from spreading. Meanwhile, Blinken sent a message warning to the Houthi militants in Yemen, saying they will face consequences for continued attacks on ships in the Red Sea. Blinken told reporters Monday in Saudi Arabia that some 40 countries have called on Houthis to stop their attacks. The top American diplomat also made stops in Turkey, Greece, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates in quick succession before his visit to Israel. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. Russia conducted a series of missile and drone attacks against provincial Ukrainian cities and villages on Monday, killing four people and injuring at least 38. The latest attacks targeted residential buildings and infrastructure, while Moscow says it hit military industrial targets in Ukraine from the sea and air. Russia targeted four regions, including Kharkiv. The daily attacks have continued since the new year, with Russian airstrikes over the weekend killing 11 Ukrainians, including five children. Now in the U.S., the world's first ever commercial space mission to land on moon has hit a setback. A charging issue and fuel loss have been detected. The craft is scheduled to make the lunar landing next month. Our Che Su Hyung has more. The world's first private moon landing craft, Peregrine Lunar Lander, is facing a serious technical problem. On Monday local time, Astrobotech, the U.S. firm that built the spacecraft, stated that it has a problem with the propulsion system causing a significant loss of fuel. They said the situation is serious enough for them to consider changing the mission goals. Peregrine was launched at 2.18 a.m. on Monday from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida on a Vulcan rocket. This 1.2-ton craft was scheduled to land on the moon on the 23rd of February. But about seven hours after the launch, an issue was discovered where the solar panels were not properly facing the sun, so couldn't properly charge the onboard battery. Astrobotic scientists managed to fix this issue, but also confirmed there was another problem, fuel loss. The Paragon Lunar Lander carries various cargo, including scientific instruments by the U.S. Space Agency, NASA, to study the lunar surface composition and radiation, as well as a small exploration robot the size of a shoebox developed by Carnegie Mellon University. NASA is just a customer in this project, though, and is not in charge. It paid 108 million U.S. dollars for Paragon to carry its equipment. If the spacecraft's landing is successful, it will be the world's first private lunar exploration to make a controlled landing on the moon and the first U.S. soft landing on the moon since Apollo 17 in 1972. Chesu Hyung, Arirang News. South Korea's space race is about to pick up speed. Its plan to launch a new space agency has been approved by a parliamentary committee. We relate a bill set to be put for a vote at a plenary session today. Our Ishi Hu explains. South Korea is one step closer to launching a new space agency. The National Assembly Science and ICT Committee on Monday passed bills to establish a new space agency that the Science Ministry has dubbed the Korea Aerospace Administration, or CASA. The bills passed are the special act for the establishment and operation of the agency and the revision to the existing Space Development Promotion Act. According to the bills, the new space agency will carry out policy making, industry promotion, international cooperation, and more in the field of aerospace. It will start with fewer than 300 personnel, but will grow its size through active recruitment. The agency will fall under the Ministry of Science and ICT and will also be monitored by the National Space Committee. The existing Korea Aerospace Research Institute and Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute will now belong to the new agency, but the physical transfer of the institutions will require approval by the parliament. Both CARI and CASA will carry out research and development. The two main parties had conflicting views on this, with the ruling People Power Party insisting the space agency should carry out R&D projects that CARI is unable to, and the main opposition Democratic Party opposing this idea, saying it would create unnecessary overlap.
The lawmakers eventually agreed to allow Kari to carry out its existing research and CASA to carry out other R&D projects. If the bills are approved at the plenary session on Tuesday, the space agency in Sacheon, Gyeongsangnam-do province, could start operations as early as May. Lee Si-hu, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In the U.S., Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is under scrutiny for his failure to disclose his hospitalization to President Joe Biden and the Pentagon for several days. The Pentagon said that Austin resumed his full duties from his hospital bed on Friday evening after being in intensive care. Amid growing criticism of Austin for lack of transparency in notifying the chain of command, the White House said Monday that it will review the situation. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said Monday that there is no plan for anything other than for Secretary Austin to stay in the job. However, a number of Republicans, including former President Donald Trump, have called for Austin to be sacked. 70-year-old Austin was admitted to intensive care at Walter Reed Military Hospital on January 1st, but he was the fourth before he made the White House aware of his condition. Austin is believed to be still in hospital. Pope Francis on Monday called for a universal ban on the practice of surrogate motherhood, condemning commercialization of pregnancy in his annual address to the Holy See's diplomatic corps. In his 45-minute address to Vatican-accredited diplomats, 87-year-old Pope Francis called for a global ban on surrogacy to prohibit the practice universally. He describes surrogacy as a deplorable act, adding that the child is a gift and never the basis of a commercial contract and that it represents a grave violation of the dignity of the woman and the child involved. In Switzerland, former Gambian interior minister Usman Sonko went on trial for crimes against humanity on Monday. Sonko faces charges including murder, multiple rapes and torture committed between 2000 and 2016. Swiss campaign group Trial International filed a complaint against him after collecting evidence along with other NGOs, with the case going ahead under the principle of universal jurisdiction for grave crimes. Nine Gambian plaintiffs will travel to the Swiss court to testify. 54-year-old Sonko fled to Switzerland in 2016 after Gambian dictator Yahya Jame lost power. According to the Human Rights Watch, Jame was responsible for widespread abuses, including forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings. Regarded as one of the world's football greats, Franz Beckenbauer died on Sunday at the age of 78. Nicknamed Der Kaiser, Beckenbauer captained the German national team to a World Cup victory in 1974 and returned as manager in 1990 to win the tournament again. The former defender spent the majority of his club career at German giants Bayern Munich in the 60s and 70s, before stints at New York Cosmos and Hamburger SV. Widespread tributes paid to Beckenbauer included from German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who said he was not only one of Germany's greatest footballers, but also created excitement for German football for generations. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. A massive winter storm has unleashed blizzard conditions across much of Korea, with more forecasts over the course of the day. The winter storm could dump snow in the capital area and Gangwon-do through tonight. Seoul could see un snowfall unseen in 14 years, with a heavy snow advisory issued, while the south will see heavy snow from this afternoon into tomorrow at dawn. Mountainous regions in Gangwon the province could see more than 20 centimeters of snowfall. The central regions and Gyeongsangbukdo province could receive up to 15 centimeters of massive snowfall through tomorrow. 
exercise caution behind a wheel, take public transportation, or avoid traveling unless it's absolutely necessary. Afternoon temperatures, meanwhile, are slightly higher than yesterday afternoon. But at least this round of wintry precipitation will not bring any significant drop in temperatures. Readings will stay warmer than norms for next few days. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. On snowy days like today, you must be careful with black ice. It's actually clear ice on the surface of roads, but it looks black because of the color of the road. In 2019, there was a black ice accident in Korea, where 47 cars collided on an expressway, causing 7 deaths and 42 injuries. Black ice is hard to detect, but you can suspect it when your car brakes don't respond properly. The first thing you should do is lightly press the brakes to reduce speed, but the steering wheel must be kept still. A study shows black ice roads are 14 times more slippery than regular ones and six times more slippery than snowy roads, so please do stay safe.